Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to this Fulbright CSIS Usindo panel discussion on politics and religion in Indonesia. My name is Mita, Associate Communications Officer at Aminef, and I will be your Master of Ceremonies for this event. Today's program will be as follows. A remarks from Dr. Phillips Fermonte, CSIS Executive Director. Opening remarks by Mr. Alan Feinstein, Aminef's Executive Director, followed by the panel discussion and Q&A on the topic. We also would like to inform you that this event is made available for live streaming at CIS, CSIS Indonesia YouTube account. Now, let's start the proceedings. I would like to invite the executive director of CSIS, who is a Fulbright alumni, alumnus, Dr. Phillips Fermonte, to give his remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to CSIS. I've seen some <clears throat> familiar faces uh, being a uh, Fulbright alumni. I will forever be grateful for the scholarship, uh, but that will not prevent me and the other alumni to be critical as well, but <laughs> if we may. Uh, now, <clears throat> we are going to have a discussion on uh, state uh, and religion in Indonesia. And uh, when the Pa Alan Feinstein of the Aminef <coughs> uh, contacted us, uh, I replied immediately, uh, agreed upon, because we at CSIS also concerned about the topic. And, and uh, given the fact that uh, we've been in this mood of election years, and of course, the question of uh, religion <coughs> and the state always comes up as we know, but uh, it seems to me that we need a thorough thinking uh, whether or not this is actually a temporal phenomenon or is it going to be a continued phenomenon. Uh, either one, I think uh, this uh, discussion today would uh, give us some perspective on the matter because uh, we do have uh, four able speakers who have been researching the topic for quite a long time and then the, I will introduce them later. But uh, to reiterate the, the MC earlier that uh, this event is a joint uh, collaboration, uh, a joint <coughs> uh, project uh, of event between CSIS and uh, Aminef Fulbright and uh, Yusindo, uh, the three of which have been collaborating in the past. And uh, I should say uh, we are ready for more uh, cooperation and collaboration with uh, Aminez and, and Fulbright. Uh, I hope today's discussion will be enlightening uh, for us and to give us some food for thoughts, uh, of course, for a future agenda of research in particular, because we uh, at CSIS as well as the speakers are academics, and then uh, hopefully we can provide some, some kind of a helicopter view about what has been going on uh, regarding the question of the state and religion and politics in Indonesia. Thank you very much once again for coming and please enjoy the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Phillips Fermonte for the remarks. And now I would like to invite the executive director of Aminef, who is also a Fulbright alumnus, Mr. Alan Feinstein. Oh, now it's on, sorry. I had to turn it on. All right, <laughs> welcome. Good afternoon, Selamat siang. Um, I'm Alan Feinstein, the director of Aminef, which is the Fulbright Commission in Indonesia. Uh, on behalf of uh, Aminef, uh, I want to welcome you all here and to thank our host and co-sponsor today, CSIS and its executive director, Dr. Phillips Fermonte, which has kindly provided its splendid facilities here and graciously supplied our lunch for those who arrived in time for lunch. Uh, I also want to thank the third co-sponsor, 
the U.S. Indonesia Society, or USINDO, uh, whose director ambassador, David Merrill, unfortunately cannot join us here. Uh, both uh, Dr. Phillips and Ambassador Merrill responded quickly, as uh, Philip just said, and enthusiastically to the initial suggestion that our three organizations collaborate in holding this public discussion today on religion and politics in Indonesia. Uh, it's fair to say that all three of our organizations are eager to increase informed, evidence-based public discussion on matters of common interest in Indonesia and the US. CSIS is Indonesia's leading policy-oriented institute. It was recently named by the Lander Institute at the University of Pennsylvania as the top think tank in Southeast Asia. I'm going to uh, uh, give them my uh, congratulations for that honor uh, of being so named this year. It has historically been the source of useful published research on economic, political, and social issues, and is very well known for public platforms for discussions of important uh, policy matters in Indonesia. USINDO uh, was founded to enhance mutual understanding of Indonesia and the United States and to deepen the relationship between the two countries and their peoples. Its Council on Religion and Pluralism was set up in 2016 for prominent leaders in both countries to cooperate on activities and programs to share and promote the values of pluralism, diversity, and tolerance. AMINEF, as you know, and as I said before, manages the Fulbright program in Indonesia, which has been going on for 66 years now. Uh, 66 years, it's opened up opportunities for Indonesians to study and do research in the US, and for Americans to come to Indonesia to do study, teach, and do research as well. Fulbright around the world is the primary means of people-to-people -people exchange between Americans and those in other countries. Equally important, Fulbrighters also create and disseminate knowledge, work on important issues in science, social science, humanities, and the arts that affect all of our societies and make important contributions in the public sphere. Thus, AMINEF is eager to provide public platforms for current grantees and alumni to contribute as public intellectuals to forums such as this one today. Indonesian Fulbrighters are prominent in government, the private sector, NGOs, and universities, and we're pleased to have several alumni participating here today, and I see many in the audience as well. Um, American Fulbrighters who have been to Indonesia make up the bulk of the Indonesianist community in, the, in American universities, uh, and you find them also in government service, in philanthropy, and the private sector. Uh, current Fulbright, U.S. Fulbright scholar Ronald Lukens Bull, professor at the University of North Florida, who originally did his dissertation research in Indonesia more than a decade ago, is back this year carrying out research on Bansar and U. And we're interested to hear his take on today's panel. Speaking of Fulbright alumni, our host and moderator and CSIS executive director, Dr. Philip Tramonte is himself a Fulbrighter, having received a grant to study at Northern Illinois University for his doctorate in political science. And as some of you may know, he's also an avid collector of heavy metal on vinyl and, indulge, and indulges his passion whenever he goes back to the US. Okay, our topic today is broadly characterized as religion and politics the relative place of religion and arguments and policies based on religion in the political sphere has become a contentious issue, as emphasized in the recent gubernatorial elections in Jakarta in 2017 and the 2019 presidential and legislative election that was just completed. The treatment of religious and other minorities is also a persistent issue in public debate. Religion also gets notoriously invoked by organized or individual perpetrators of violence and terrorism, as recent events in Pittsburgh, San Diego, Christchurch, and Colombo tragically show. The five experts that we've invited uh, here today 
each comes at these issues from a dif different and unique angle, and we hope this will be a lively discussion among them and will allow for interactions with you in the audience uh, after their presentations. Uh, I'll leave it to Dr. Philip Sramante to do the introductions of each one of them and to himself provide reactions, and we look forward to his, his contribution as well to the discussion. So please join me in showing appreciation for Dr. Phillips from Monte CSIS and our invited panelists. Thank you, Pa Alan, for the opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite our moderator of the panel discussion, Dr. Phillips Fermonte. Thank you, MC. Uh, I'd like to invite all the speakers to come to the stage. Uh, Professor Ronald uh, Lukensbo and uh, Dr. Ahmad Munjit, Ms. Nafa, uh, Ms. Titi Angreni, and uh, Mr. Nori Oktariza. Please be careful with the seat, uh, not to slide to the back. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let us start the discussion. Uh, by way of introduction, I'd like to approach the, the problem by um, discussing my uh, own observation about what has been going on, particularly since uh, uh, the Jakarta governor election in 2017. As we know, some have referred to this event uh, in 2017 as a kind of a <clears throat> an event that shows the increasing, uh, to some observer, increasing conservatism in Indonesia that uh, melted into the Indonesian politics. Uh, if you remember or follow the Indonesian news uh, in 2017, uh, there were, for example, banners uh, across the city uh, in 2017 during the election <coughs> stating that if you are not if you are voting for uh, at the time the governor uh, incumbent Ahok if you die you would not be buried here or you would not be taken care of by the community and so on and so forth uh, <coughs> it just so happened that uh, at one night uh, during those days uh, <coughs> I was preparing a, a material for my lecture the next uh, day I was teaching a graduate class, class at the one university in, in Jakarta. And then the, I <coughs> come across this reading uh, by Herb Fates explaining about the Indonesian politics back in the 1950s. And one of the footnotes in that reading, interestingly, was a quote from uh, <coughs> uh, the work of uh, the great anthropologist uh, Clifford Gitts. And then the, in his book, the, the title was uh, Rituals and social change, if I'm not mistaken. And Gates was describing what happened in the village where he lived in. Uh, he, he studied uh, Indonesia and lived in, the <coughs> in Pari and Kadiri. So in that book, he described an event <coughs> on July 12, 1957 in the village where he lived. And uh, it was the death of a, a young man, uh, the villagers, uh, but he, he was a member of the umbrella organization of the Indonesian Communist Party, uh, PKI. And the Kiais and the people in the village refused to bury him. And that was July 12, 1957. And when I was reading that, it was <coughs> February 2017 in Jakarta. So there was this 50 years apart from that event that was described by Clifford Gates in 1957 and what happened in Jakarta in 2017. So the question to me at that night, that night was that maybe we've been progressing, but because of the election, 
we are regressing back. Or something has never changed in some aspects of our religious life and the relationship between religious religion and politics in Indonesia. So with that kind of introduction, I hope all the speakers, five speakers here would uh, have their takes on what has been going on uh, in Indonesia. Uh, they may take a long shot uh, from 1950s or they can just speak about the current event, the Indonesian election and so on and so forth. I leave it to them, and, but uh, maybe from the, the floor uh, later on we will have a more rich discussion. Now, the first speaker would be Professor Ronald Lukens Bull. He's the 2018 U.S. Fulbright Senior Scholars. <clears throat> He's a professor of anthropology and religious studies at the University of North Florida. And the second speaker <clears throat> would be Dr. Ahmad Munjid, a longtime friend. He's a lecturer and researcher at Gajah Mada University. He studied <clears throat> his uh, master's degree uh, on religious studies at Temple University in Philadelphia. And uh, the third speaker, we have Ms. Nafa Nurania. Those of you who are following the issue and study about radicalism, terrorism, conservatism in Indonesia would might already know her. Uh, she has produced a lot of studies for the Institute for Policy Analysis of Conflict, IPAC, uh, in Jakarta. And uh, the fourth speaker is Mr. Nuri Oktariza. He is a Young Turks at CSIS. Uh, he is a 2014 Fulbright alumnus. Uh, he's doing his, uh, he did his master's degree in political science from Ohio, State, uh, Ohio University. And last but not least, uh, Ibu Titi Angraini, the executive director of uh, Perludem, the Perkumpulan untuk Pemilu and Democracy. She is a well known face, and uh, her thoughts uh, we've <coughs> uh, engaged so much about the election and especially. Uh, on the female and politics, women and politics in Indonesia, uh, I believe she will touch upon the, on that issue as well. Now, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Ronald. Uh, each of you, I'll give 10 minutes, and uh, I'll be kind of uh, strict in, in the timing, please. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you, um, thank Amenef and CSIS and Yusinda for putting this on. And since I only have 10 minutes, it's about all the Sompan Santun I'm going to do. Um, I actually wrote down notes and then I left them promptly in the other room. So, um, but uh, I've got two, basically two points, uh, or two, I had two Roman numerals in those notes. One concerns the question of polarization, and the other includes. Uh, the, the question of influence without power. So first about the question of polarization. There, I mean, there was a lot of talk about religious polarization and I'm not sure it's accurate and I'm not sure it's accurate for a couple of reasons. So, so let's just assume for a second we're talking there, there are two poles. There is the moderate pole that backed Jacoby and the not-so-moderate poll that backed Proboo. Well, with the not-so-moderate poll that backed Proboo, uh, three prominent groups, uh, what, what used to be called Hatae, uh, PKS, and FPE, these are Takfiri groups who call each other Kafir. <laughs> there is, a, at most, I think, a temporary alliance. Um, to maybe oppose all things touched by Ahok, then that would include Jokowi. Um, if Prabowo would have won, then without a common enemy, they, they might start, I mean, just, just, just religiously keep in mind that like what FPE does for religious purposes, the Talilan, Ziara, the other groups called Bida and Shirk, so, you know, there, this is, you know, polarization, I'm not sure that th that poll is unified. Well, let's take a look at the other poll, and I'm going to focus on Enu because I, that's, I've been with Enu mostly for the last um, not six, seven months. Um, exit polls, 55% of people associated with Enu voted uh, Jokowi, which means 
45% voted pro bono. So that label, NU, is not meaningful politically. Um, you know, that because, now, yes, um, there were posters that said if you're a and who you have to support, you have to vote for the ulama. Actually, they rarely said vote for Gajkowi. They, you have to vote for the Kiai um, or for the ulama. So, but one of the interesting differences between 2014 and 2019 with Gepe Ansar and Bansar is in 2014, all these events had a call for Salam Duwajari, which was Jokowi's sign at the time. None of the events that I went to that were specifically Ansar, Bansar events, had calls for Salam Satujari. None. Photo sessions in 2014. Put up your two fingers. Everyone does it. If anyone, in 2019, if anyone called for the Jokowi sign, and it rarely happened, people would say, no, no, salam jari satu, salam commando. And so we would do this. So I haven't quite fully analyzed what that means, but it means in practice at least that section of NU really didn't want to deal with the elections. They weren't backing either, per se. Um, and again, I haven't fully figured out what that means. Maybe my colleagues can help me think about this a little bit. Um, so that's, that's my point on, um, on, polariz oh, on polarization. Um, be now, the other point is related is that the level of influence that, um, I like the term, I'm borrowing a term, I'm borrowing and modifying a term from Farid al-Atas for what we often call Islamists, and, and that is, he calls them behaviorists, people who are concerned about behave, religious behavior, moral behavior, their behavior, but other people's behavior being them. And I, I also sometimes think of them as being restrictive. So restrictive behaviorists, the people who are interested in restricting their behavior and other people's behavior. And the and other people's behavior is the important distinction from other religious expressions in Indonesia. Um, and to have the influence, so if we remember back a decade to, uh, when uh, Sharia parties held like about 14% of the seats, uh, that a legislation that didn't really have any teeth, really hasn't been super enforced, the anti-pornography law passed. Who's going to be pro-pornography? More, re <laughs> more recently, a law, uh, the, you know, about four or five years ago, the ban on selling beer at mini-marts past. The restrictive behaviorists are able to introduce into public discourse small incremental restrictions. And it's the, the so-called moderates have a hard time opposing, again, which politician is going to run on beer for everyone, here at least. Um, I mean, in the United States, we always talk about which candidate we'd want to have beer with. So, you know, that would work in the U.S., but it, it doesn't work here. Um, and so, you know, you know and, and, and my friend and colleague and actually former teacher, Mark Woodward, said, oh, oh, see, the election shows that religion isn't shaping politics because Proboa didn't win. And I said, yeah, but what about this factor, the fact that this group got enough votes that they can push and push small incremental bits of Sharia. I know that's, that, that term requires definition, and I'm not going to define it. That's why I did the air quotes. Uh, but small bits of re restrictive legislation 
Um, that, and by the way, oftentimes these restrictive legisl legislation only impacts the lowest class, right? Um, if you've got money, you can still get beer and whiskey. If you can afford to shop at Grand Indonesia, you can get any alcohol you want. Um, and, you know, and what's interesting is I've actually had Kiai friends tell me they oppose this legislation because now the poor people are drinking oplosan uh, and getting, dying or going blind. And so, you know, again, that's kind of a, maybe be a moderate perspective too, or a perspective that says it is better to tell people and encourage people to do the right thing rather than legislate the right thing. By trying to legislate the right thing, first of all, people aren't doing the right thing because it's the right thing. They're doing the right thing because they can't do anything else. And two, the alternatives can be more dangerous. And so, you know, I do see there's a, that the distinction between sort of um, the restrictive and non-restrictive and but I'm not, again, not sure that uh, polarization uh, is what we need to think of. There is a third poll that thankfully only achieved about 20% representation or non-representation, uh, and that's Goldput. Uh, in the United States, we, in our last presidential election, we had 42% of Americans not vote, which means that Donald Trump, you know, oh, Donald Trump only has 30% approval rating. Well, that's his base. That's all he needs is 30%. Because half of the actual electorate is only 30% of the population. So I, I think the group that we're not talking about and we need to think about if they get any bigger here in Indonesia, now they're not very big, but is, is gold put, because if a gold put gets bigger, then the politicians have to appeal to increasingly smaller groups of voters. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you for keeping up with the time, uh, for sure. There will be questions uh, later on. Now, I'd like to invite Dr. Ahmad Munjit for his uh, 10 minutes time. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Philip. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Aminef, uh, Yusindo, and CSIS for including me in this exciting session. Um, my, presentation to, my presentation today would be the question of identity politics in 2019 election. Um, this is safer for me uh, rather than providing the answer for of the problem of identity politics. So I would like to raise some question, and hoping that probably together we can find some uh, answer. All right, we, we have just <coughs> finished with, uh, you want to move on with? Uh, go ahead. Uh, we just have finished with the election that uh, got wide appreciation across the globe, that in general, the election was successful and peaceful uh, with decisive result for both came actually in different meaning. Uh, but then the question for us is with all of that we have, do now we have stronger democracy or actually uh, to continue the discussion by Pat Ronald, a uh, divided nation? Because, you know, the, the footer turnout is very high, more than 80%. Um, and then that means the public participation in the election was very, very high. Uh, but then uh, from time to time, even when the election is already done, uh, people still call each other Chebong and Kampret, including Ulama Chebong and Ulama Kampret, you know, the the Muslim scholar Chebong and Kampret. Uh, so the problem uh, of polarization is really visible. And it became worse because the one group called the other as irreligious, anti-Islam in particular, 
you know. Uh, and the other call uh, the, uh, the, the, the other group as immoral and anti-diversity, both of which considered as very serious threat, not only to their group, but also to the entire nation. And that's happened because exactly because politics and religion uh, mix, and you know that when politics and religion uh, are, are mixed, they're like oil and fire. They create more flame than light. So that's the reason why we have this uh, problem. Um, and then I just borrowed this data from Mas Philip and others. Uh, when we pay attention to the result of the you know, election, the footers profile, if we see them by religion, it is very interesting that 51% Muslims voted for Jokowi, 49% voted for Prabowo. But remember that this you know, Muslim consists of 87%, the largest portion of the population. So what happened to them means a lot. Um, and when we look at what happened to non-Muslim, 97% non-Muslim voted for Prabowo, uh, for, for Jokowi, sorry, and 3%, and, and only 3% uh, voted for Prabowo. So this, by looking at this number alone, we can sense something. Um, then if we go by ethnic, Japanese, 65% uh, voted for Jokowi and 35% uh, for Prabowo. But again, Japanese ethnic group consists of 40% of the population. So what happened to them means a lot to the entire uh, population. And if you pay attention to the other ethnic groups, Sundanese, Madurese, Betawi, uh, Minang, Achenese, uh, most voted for Prabowo. And this ethnic group is identified, they have been identified as ethnic group with strong Islamic identity. Uh, so Mas Philip is from Minang. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't accuse him of uh, you know, being part of this, but uh, you know, uh, it is very, very interesting. In the past, in 1955 election, this ethnic group are supporter of Masumi. So West Java, and Sumatra and also uh, South Kalimantan and South Sulawesi, they're like the, you know, uh, the base uh, for Masumi, the stronghold for, for Masumi. So what does it mean? Um, and, and if we look at, uh, this is the data from Mas Philip, footer by province, you can see how uh, the you know, food is distributed in relation to uh, you know, the, the previous categories that I've uh, provided based on ethnic group as well as uh, uh, you know, on, 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 on religion. It is interesting that in Sumatra, you know, uh, Jokowi won in Lampung, and we know that in Lampung, many Japanese live there. In West Java, Prabowo won, but if you go to Cirebon, to Indramayu, where many Japanese live, Jokowi wounds. So there is something here. Uh, you know, when we see uh, Islam, ethnic group, especially Java, and other ethnic group with strong Islamic identity in you know, their political preference uh, related to the presidential uh, election. Okay, <clears throat> so clearly identity politics is very strong uh, 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 problem in this election and the previous election. By identity politics, I mean exploitation of exclusive identity, like religion, ethnicity, race, uh, social groups, and other, for political mobilization. The question is why it looks more effectively works now. What's going on? Uh, you know, uh, to answer that question, we can move from two direction from the you know, from, from the bigger picture. Uh, globalization, we know. Uh, initially, some scholar believed that globalization means the easier and faster and more intensive movement across borders 
of people, ideas, goods, money, etc. However, in later observation, we know that globalization also means deeper fraction because of the changing of, of landscape uh, by the you know, migration of people, uh, also the flow of ideas, money, and others. You know, the landscape of the people change. And global capitalism uh, is not only about growth. You know, from time to time, including in our country, our economy is better, but at the same time, the gap between the rich and the poor also grow bigger. So yes, our life is better, but the gap between us, uh, you know, uh, who are under the line and those who are above the line is also bigger. Um, now, in, in the election, uh, both group address the same thing, but by using different languages. Prabowo keep using the language of gap. Jokowi keep using the language of growth. Both are true, but they're speaking to different, you know, uh, in, in, uh, to different target. So uh, we will go back to this later. Uh, please move on with, uh, no. Uh, Mas Philip mentioned earlier uh, about, you know, uh, the 2017, uh, you know, election in Jakarta. And one of the strong word that uh, was used is about victimization of Islam. The question is, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country, and yet Muslims speak about marginalization and victimization of Islam. How does it make any sense? However, if it look across the globe, that actually also the language used by Donald Trump, the language used by the right-wing uh, politician in Europe, also in Australia uh, and New Zealand. So it's, it's, it's something that is not uh, particularly uh, Indonesian. And when we look at that, you know, with, uh, and therefore the language of gap is very effective for those who, you know, uh, uh, bring up this, this language of victimization of Islam. Um, the, and, and with that, they also then uh, revive the goals of Jakarta Charter because the discussion whether Islam should be part of the constitution, Islam should be part of Indonesian politics is not over. And from time to time we uh, hear, you know, uh, people brought that back. In relation to that, we also remember that in the past, in 1980s until, you know, uh, uh, 70s and 80s, Suharto effectively depoliticized Islam, Islamic party, Islamic group, you know, uh, and to make sure that uh, the threat of political Islam uh, can be get rid of. Now, uh, and uh, in 1990s, however, we know that Suharto moved closer to Islam. Uh, Harold Jenkins, I believe, uh, the Australian uh, scholar who wrote uh, Suharto and his general, wrote that you know, in 1977 election, uh, Suharto invited uh, prominent Christian leaders, and upon their arrival in his office, he said that our common enemy is Islam. That in 1977. And Suharto was very powerful during time, and uh, he was very close to uh, Christian. But then in 1990s, when his military back uh, is you know, decreasing, and you know, uh, 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 then he moved closer to Islam. Can we imagine what is being imagined by the Christian leader about what possibly Suharto told to Muslim leader? if in the 1977 he told them like that, right? And that's the reason why the tension among Muslim and Christian increased. And, and as we know that in the mid-1990s and soon after Suharto uh, uh, was forced uh, down from power, uh, the ethno-religious uh, conflict erupted. Now, after Reformasi, we experienced over what I call as the over-religionization of Islam. By of religionization, I mean uh, the use of religious symbol, especially Islamic symbol, in public sphere is very, very strong. 
uh, I teach at UGM, and many of my students, when they want to give group presentation, they started with Assalamu alaikum. This is, this is not pengajian, you know, religious Islamic uh, gathering, uh, and non you know, as Muslim students also are part of the class. But why some students feel strongly to express their religious identity? And the other day, uh, I was about to fly here to Jakarta in Jogja. It was Maghrib time. And all of a sudden, I, 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 I you know, uh, heard the adhan uh, was broadcasted to the waiting room in the airport. And, you know. Uh, th this is just little examples how public space is being religionized in the sense of Islamicized. And that is part of the consequences of, you know, in the, in the past Islam was repressed, but then in 1990s Islam was being the Anamas, the uh, favorite, you know, favorite ally. Um, now, after the reformacy, therefore, uh, Islamic group you know, so the opportunity to express uh, their, their political uh, power uh, by, you know, articulating, you know, uh, religion in, in, public, in public space. Of course, uh, because of the nature of capitalism, there's a gap, but how, and, and grievances, but how that gap uh, is real uh, and, 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 and legitimate as, as a base for uh, 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 protest is uh, different things. Now, the, the gap, the perceived gap, the perceived grievance and the objective grievance are not necessarily the same. Um, in the past, we uh, know that Islam suffered from numeric majority with minority mentality. That's a very popular term by Chak Noor. Today, that term is used again, although the situation is totally different, meaning that many people see the new reality by using the old perception. And uh, to some degree, you know, when this language is used, it works effectively in politics, including when you know, we listen to what happened to the uh, Prabowo campaign uh, in this election. Okay, so what happened to uh, 212 movement, I believe, is, uh, you know, a kind of perceived injustice. There is injustice in the country, uh, but then that injustice is perceived in certain way and then translated into their, you know, into collective experience among the people. It is interesting that most of the people who are involved in the protests are, many of them are middle class Muslim whose economic status is not as worse as those who are on the, labor, on the lower class. However, they are more outspoken in criticizing the injustice, the, you know, uh, the marginalization of Islam, the uh, victimization of Islam. Uh, now, I want to raise uh, uh, this idea related to uh, you know, the introduction by Mas Philip, uh, the ab what I call as the abangan factor. Uh, when we saw the data from the election, uh, we can sense where do you think is identity politics works most effectively? You know, it works most effectively in Professor Mahfud M. Day uh, used the wrong words as the hardliners provinces, and you know uh, he created trouble. Uh, but it works very well there in, in West Java and in Sumatra and uh, South Kalimantan and South uh, Sulawesi. It works very well among the ethnic group whose identity, uh, who, uh, whose Islam is strong as their uh, identity. But where does it work less effectively? I mentioned earlier the Javanese ethnic group consists of 40% uh, percent of the population and it, the politic identity works less effectively uh, in Central Java and in East Java. And when we go to West Java, it works among the uh, Chirbonis and Indramayus. And in Lampung, uh, also where uh, many Javanese live, it works less effectively. So uh, Javanese factor plays some role there, I believe. Um, and even 
Uh, because of the big number of Japanese uh, population, I would say that East and Central Java can be seen as the guardian of inclusive indigenized Islam. Most, most Muslim footed for Prabowo. I don't, I don't mean to say that uh, many of them are like hardliners or radicals or, or something like that. Uh, but I would say that many of the Muslims, you know, uh, uh, are entrapped by identity politics. However, Japanese Muslim, in comparison to other, they are less entrapped by identity politics. And I think abangan, abangan not in the definition given by uh, Gertz, uh, but abangan in the sense uh, that, you know, uh, it's, it's a kind of value, it's kind of worldview, a productive dialogue between Islam and local culture. So I think by rethinking about the definition of abangan, uh, you know, a friendly encounter and dialogue between faith and local culture, I think is, is one way to, you know, to solve the problem of identity politics and polarization uh, in the society. Uh, I, with that, I, uh, I end my presentation and I welcome any comment or question later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Ahmad Munjit. I saw some sparks in the eyes in the audience. I think they already have questions and uh, ideas about what uh, Pak Munjit have been saying uh, later on will be translated into questions. Now I'd like to invite a third speaker. <coughs> in the line, uh, we have um, Ibu Nafa. Please, uh, the 10 minutes is yours. Thank you, Pak Philip. Good afternoon and assalamualaikum, because why not? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's really nice to be here. Maybe I'm the only non-Fulbright alumni in the panel, so thank you. And I'm going to talk about the Islamist agenda beyond 2019. When I say Islamist, I just specifically focus on the Islamist civil society groups that made up the 212 movement and not so much on the political party. Oh. Okay, I'll start by showing you this image. So the Reuni Akbar, there were hundreds of thousands of people, whereas um, I expected that there would be an immediate demo uh, right on the election day, but it turns out that it was on, on Kartanegara, it was very, not that many people, you know, a thousand, two thousand top. And so, and the people there were mostly just Prabowo's diehards. They don't even look like the crowd in the 212. So, well, some of the, some of the leaders, the Ustad were there, but the, the audience was, they, they, they even look different. And so where are the others? Just business as usual. Uh, Ustad Bahtiar Nasir, for example, just two days, we, um, he, he's running a lot of programs in his Islamic center. Um, you know, like seminars on how to uh, go to heaven, you pay five million for VIP. I don't know VIP here or in the heaven. <laughs> But um, Ustad, Ustad Felix Shiao, for example, is still doing his tour, uh, traveling stuff in Turkey. So it, they look very calm. Then I was just baffled. Where are they? I thought they would be you know, ready right away because of all the narratives about fraud. Um, and don't forget that next, uh, in a, is it next Monday, or so? uh, it's Ramadan already, and that's the peak of Islamic commodification. So we don't expect any demo, at least not yet. Um, so why, why is the, this so-called people, people power unlikely, at least at the moment? Um, first, I think it's the, the turnout at this, you know, the, the demo in the past week, for example, in front of Bawaslu, it's been really, really small. Uh, partly because it's a different mission than the 212. Uh, the 212 was framed as a moral force against uh, evil, whereas right now it's just, you know, plain power politics, which maybe are not very appealing to some segments of the 212 crowd. And, um, and so since they couldn't mobilize that many people, then there was this uh, kind of meme on social media that, no, it's actually deliberate. We didn't try to mobilize. We, uh, they actually, for example, some FBA leaders told uh, people 
don't get provoked, jangan terprovokasi, don't fall into the government trap, they want us to you know, create chaos, go into the street, but don't, we won't do that. Um, is that just a face-saving narrative because they're embarrassed with the turnout of the demo? Uh, but I think it's, it's more than that. It's also their attempt, uh, for example, the Ijtima Ulama yesterday, it was an effort to buy time and also to uh, establish, uh, establish legitimacy. Because if they, um, if, if they have some sort of fatwa as the basis and they can frame it as a moral struggle then, uh, and, and also they can prepare the resources, I mean, you can't just you know, um, mobilize a massive demo overnight. You need time, build resources, networks and everything. Um, and, but it doesn't mean that mass protests I are out of the table. For some factions of the 212 Alliance, actually they're more eager than others to, uh, to do this people power movement. So what are the factions? Uh, I'll just go quickly. Um, so what we call the 212 movement, the, the coordinators, the organizers actually uh, consist of various uh, Islamic movements. Uh, but I'll just focus on three, the Salafi and Modernist, the FPI and HTI. Now, the, what I call the Salafi is not the quiet Salafi, but the activist Salafi. Some of them, yes, graduated from Saudi Arabia, but they're mostly locally funded. And um, they're, 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 their constituency are mainly middle class Muslims. They've got extensive school networks, business, you know, all these clothing, books, whatever, uh, they have these business networks and they're more concerned with high politics as opposed to practical politics or what they call dirty politics. But on elections, for example, groups like uh, Wahda Islamiyah that is led by Zaitun Rasmin is included in this category, Bastiar Nasir is also in this category and also other modernists who are affiliated with uh, maybe Muhammadiyah and maybe uh, Dewan Dakwah. Uh, but what, what makes them different from FPI is that um, first they, they're more, uh, they're more uh, economically well off uh, and they, they focus on this high politics even though in election they would support certain candidates but they don't want to be beholden to these political elites. They want to be equal or even uh, act as the advisors of these, uh, of these politicians. Whereas FPI is um, it's a uh, theologically, it's a Sunni traditionalist closer to NU uh, but mostly uh, led by Hadrami, like Habib Rizik, and non-NU traditionally, some of them are ex-Mashumi, for example, and the, their main uh, followers are the urban poor, uh, so different from the Salafi crowd. And um, so they're, they're interested in making money, uh, gaining income, for example, uh, through what Ian Wilson calls morally through racketeering, and also as civilian auxiliary. So um, they, you know, they work with the police, for example, to, uh, uh, to, to, to protect when a, uh, a demonstration to be peaceful so it doesn't go violent. Whereas Hizbut Tahrir is, as you know, it's part of the transnational movement. It has a very strong base at university, studied in the uh, 1980s, and their focus, they're really anti-democracy. So for all the noise that they made during the, the election campaign uh, about, you know, Jokowi, Speke and everything, many of Hizbut, Hizbut Tahrir people actually didn't vote. Um, so this, these people, you know, despite their theological differences, their tactical and personal rivalries, as you know that, for example, uh, the, the chief of GNPFM, Uih Batiar Nasir, was fired and replaced by an FPI guy. So there was all these personal rivalries, but it was papered over by uh, their desire to defeat uh, Ahok and then Jokowi. But it's, it's really likely that uh, more disagreement and splintering uh, will happen again. But let's say that, uh, let's say that they all uh, you know, agree to go through the legal, for, uh, legal formal channels, like what the Ijtima Ulama said, um, and you know, go to MK appeal and then accept whatever MK's decision uh, is. Uh, in that, you know, even in that ideal world, is the movement going to be over? No, because, oops, okay, because this is not the end game for them. They have a very long-term agenda. So, for example, if you see the posting of Felix Xiao uh, on the day of the election after seeing the quick count result, but, uh, he said um, this is not a defeat uh, because uh, s look how, how far we've come. You know, in, uh, 10 years ago, the da'wah isn't this strong, but now it's very strong. And so this is uh, what we call a mini victory before the real victory. So what's their long-term agenda? Is it a global caliphate? Yes, maybe for Hizbut Tahrir, but they also know that it's too utopian. 
So, and they're not that, uh, um, they're also intellectual, you know, they think about these things. Is it an Islamic state in Indonesia? Well, yes, but maybe not another Darul Islam, you know, not through violent means. So um, this, uh, this new segment of Islamic revivalists, what we see in not just in urban areas, but also in other parts of Indonesia, as we see the, the result of exit polls, most of the Prabowo voters, for example, are younger people, and other surveys also show that younger people are, tend to be more conservative. So this is, what, this is the new generation of Islamic revivalism. They want to have it all. They want uh, piety, they want moral order, but they also want upward mobility. So they don't want any, uh, you know, thing, uh, chaos that could disrupt their lifestyle, for example, and their business prospect, for example. And so that's why they prefer for a slow-paced white revolution. Ideologically, they're very fluid. You're gonna put them in certain category. You know, they follow Ustad Somat, who is traditionalist. But they also like Ustad Adhi Hidayat, who is from Muhammadiyah, and maybe closer to Salafi. So. Um, so what they want really is a bottom-up Islamization, not top-down. And it, start, it all starts from kindergarten. Kindergarten is a huge thing, as you all know. Uh, and then, uh, but what we'll see, I think, in the, at least in the immediate future, is the convergence of Islamic revivalism and ultranationalism. So this is, I think what's likely that we see is Islamist majoritarianism. Not a full-blown Islamic state like in Syria or nothing like that, but what's li more likely in the Indonesian context is majoritarianism. This is where members of the majority faith and culture are viewed as the nation's true citizens. The others, the minority, are just numpang. They're just guest citizens. Um, so the statements uh, of the two and two leaders actually suggest that. For example, one, one leader said, we, we don't want Islamic State, we don't want to change. We also accept NKRI, but my NKRI is better, better than yours. Why? Another person said, because in our NKRI, 90% of the population also have 90% of jobs and positions. And then uh, another leader said, Islam accepts democracy, but the question is, does democracy accept Islam? So this is different, for, very different from the violent jihadists. They don't cross over. And, um, so I don't agree if some people say, uh, you know, conservatism is, or intolerance is, is a precursor to extre violent extremism, for example. I don't, I don't agree with that statement because they, they really uh, disagree on the methods and what kind of Islamic state that they imagine. So what's the majority, majoritarian issues in practical terms? First, I think it's the Pancasila and Islam. As Pak Munjit said, you know, there's the ghost of the uh, Jakarta Charter. But they, I think only FPI now wants to restore the, uh, the, the Jakarta Charter. The others, they don't necessarily, it's, it's too hard, you know. We've tried twice, twice in the parliament to change back to Jakarta Charter, but it didn't work out. So the easy thing is to reinterpret Pancasila in light of Islamic values. What kind of Islamic values? Well, their own interpretations. So um, they want to turn the table by saying that Islamists are the true nationalists. If you're anti-Islam, uh, then you're against the majority, then you're not nationalist. And then they want to defend orthodoxy, Sunni orthodoxy, so we'll, we're likely to see more uh, you know, blasphemy cases, for example. But now the question is whose version? Because the leaders of 212 also come from different theological backgrounds. Is it the Salafi version of orthodoxy? Is this Habib Rizik's version? And then the third one is, uh, I don't think, uh, Perda Sharia would be that much of an issue anymore. I mean, uh, the existing Perda Sharia would not really have not been really enforced. And so, what they want is to in incorporate Islamic moral values in national law, in laws that seem to be secular, like the sexual violence law, for example, like the um, the marriage law, for example, that seem like secular issues, but uh, that's that uh, that that have bigger impact in people's life. So. And if you're interested in our reports, oh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Nafa, I think that's a very uh, kind of a persuasive approach to this question about the, the agenda of the, <clears throat> the Islamist uh, group uh, in Indonesia. Now, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Okta of CSIS. Uh, the 10 minutes is yours. Thank you, Bung Phillips. Uh, first and foremost, I have to say uh, thank you again to Fulbright for a very generous scholarship that helped me to study in the state. I studied in 2014 to 2016, and I think without that scholarship, I'm not going to be allowed to sit here on the stage. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you again. 
Uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, the thing that already been uh, touched upon briefly by previous speakers uh, about polarization uh, in Indonesia. But I think um, I wanna uh, challenge a little bit about our common understanding about uh, polarization in Indonesia uh, by asking uh, what do we exactly mean by saying that polarization uh, has been on the rise uh, in Indonesia these days and also to the extent that polarization really prevails uh, in Indonesia, does that uh, have to do with regional factors or regional locations? That is to say, uh, does regional uh, factors actually influence more our you know, seemingly polarization in our country than let's say religious uh, issue? Because uh, when we talk about uh, polarization, sometimes we refer to uh, religious uh, polarization uh, actually, so uh, please next slide. <clears throat> no, yes. What is polarization? So, in a in a political science terms, uh, the concept of polarization sometimes refers to the cases in which uh, one views or one stands on a number of issues such as policies uh, or political parties is greatly uh, driven by his or her affiliation with particular uh, ideologies or political parties. So in the US, uh, for instance, if you are a republic, domestic politics, and so on and so forth. And in Indonesia context, as Philips already mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, 2016 and 2017, uh, we have a very polarizing uh, elections, uh, smear campaign at the time. So whether you are supporters of Ahok, or you are supporters of Anis, uh, you're gonna have a very different political opinion, very different opinion on elections, on politics, and maybe beyond uh, that as well. And according to many research, polarization is bad for democracy because it actually hampers people to cooperate each other. And then people can get uh, easily uh, suspicious with each other and then that makes uh, democracy hard to work out because in some ways, democracy requires you know, cooperation uh, among, peop uh, among, among people in particular countries. So that's gonna be very bad for, uh, for, for, for people because if you don't cooperate, then what you can find is just gridlock, political deadlock and things like that. Now, next. If Indonesia has been really uh, polarizing uh, in recent years, uh, I want to ask, has it been really translated into votes in the presidential election that we just had these days? And if yes, how do we know? And then uh, we also know that uh, between the two candidates, Jokowi and Prabowo, Prabowo was the one who thought to be representative of uh, Islamic groups. And then I want to ask, this votes from Islamic groups tend to be given to Prabowo instead of Pak Jokowi, right? And then the problem uh, with uh, proving whether or not the votes for Islamic groups will go to Prabowo is that how do, you, how do you measure that? And one of the most common ways of doing it is actually by, and the easiest one is by survey, so asking people about their religious affiliations. So for instance, if you are the members, or sympathizers of FPI, HDI, you might tend to vote for Prabowo instead of Pak Jokowi. Then if you are the members of PKS, for instance, or sympathizers of PKS, you're gonna vote for him instead of uh, Pak Jokowi. But I think this kind of uh, proxy is uh, quite problematic because it's, it tends to just validating you know, people's uh, religious affiliations. So I think, uh, it would be better if we have a, a more neutral uh, parameter. And that is to say in this regard, I use the number of mosques across uh, Indonesia. So the hypothesis would be the area or districts uh, in this presentation with higher mosque densities, meaning that more mouse relative to the number of populations in particular districts will tend to vote for Prabowo. That's the hypothesis. Right? Because we believe that those Islamic group will tend to vote for Prabowo instead of Pak Jokowi. And then next slide. And here's, <clears throat> here's what I did. Uh, 
in a very short exercise. So I used data from Indo Dapur World Bank uh, to get a total population at district level. Uh, the last data was in 2015. Then I extrapolate that into 2017 because the data of the total number of mosques at Kabupaten Kota was in 2017. So I need to extrapolate that. Uh, and then the data of the, the number of mosques was in the sub-district or in Kecamatan and then I add up into total number of mosques at the Kabupaten Kota. And then I'm gonna uh, see <coughs> what I call a mosque, mosque density. And then I also use the data from Kawal Pemilu, uh, the final results of the 2014 elections when the two first met. And then the ongoing results of uh, KPU, right? As we know that the manual counting is still undergoing right now. But uh, I think the last one we have uh, more than 60% uh, already accounted manually by KPU. And then the last one I use uh, data wrapper.de for geotagging the, the, the map. Um, next slide. <coughs> uh, this is the map of the Indonesian population at district level in 2017. Um, it's not really telling here, just next, mass. And then this is the mass distribution in Indonesia uh, at district level. So obviously uh, in Java, uh, in which you have you know, millions of populations, it's gonna have, have more mouse than other areas in Indonesia. And then in the eastern part of Indonesia and then the northern part of uh, Kalimantan uh, Island, you see uh, they have less mouse than uh, other areas in Indonesia. But next slide. Uh, just relying on the number of mosques, I think will not uh, fair enough because obviously provinces with higher uh, population size like Java, right, West Java, East Java, and Central Java will tend to have a more mosque than other uh, provinces, like in my hometown in Jambi, for instance. <laughs> so I use this mosque density. So you calculate uh, the uh, total number of mosques in particular uh, district, sorry, total population in particular district, and then you divided it with uh, the total number of mosques uh, in those districts. And then in this graph, I remove Papua because Papua is an extreme outlier here because the graph will be all the way to the right if I put Papua in there. So you see the, the least mosque in Indonesia was a provinces in which Muslims were minorities. So in Papua Barat and then in Bali, then you can see also in Kalimantan Utara, in Sulawesi Utara, so those are uh, outliers, and then uh, the rest are just normal uh, distributions here. Okay, next slide. I think just, yeah. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> so I wanted to know whether the higher uh, mass density uh, districts in Indonesia will tend to vote for Prabowo or not. That's, you know, to, to test uh, our uh, hypothesis. And then if you look at to these numbers, uh, in, the first, in the first one you see that uh, districts uh, with higher mass density, so one mass less than 400 people in particular district, it turns out that they tend to vote to Pak Jokowi instead of to uh, Prabowo. Prabowo. And then across the board, if you, uh, the next uh, graph, uh, districts with a high, uh, lesser, with less uh, uh, mass density will also vote for Pak Jokowi. And this is very uh, interesting, you know, I can uh, show you uh, the next uh, graphs, the next map, that uh, this will actually impact, you know, the our seemingly polarizations that we understand. Because I think if I look at to the, uh, the map, mass, if I look at to the map, uh, just next slide, like, yeah. 
So Jokowi versus Prabowo in 2019 uh, at district level. So you see the red color is for Pak Jokowi and then the blue color is for Pak Prabowo. I'm sorry if the, the phone is just too small. I use free stuff here. <laughs> um, you see, uh, it's a very uh, polarizing uh, in terms of uh, regional uh, differences. So Pak Jokowi wins clearly uh, in Kalimantan and also in Java. It's mostly in uh, West Java and then also in East Java and also in the, in the Papua. The gray color means that the manual counting are not finished yet in uh, those uh, districts. Whereas uh, Prabowo clearly uh, wins in, the, in Sumatra Island. But you see, Jokowi can take some districts uh, in the outer uh, area of, uh, of Pulau Sumatra in which many non-Muslim populations reside, reside there. And then if you compare to the next slide, this is the result of 2014 uh, elections. So in 2014, Jokowi wins across the board in all islands in Indonesia. Even he leads Prabowo in Pulau Sumatra. But in 2019, it's a very contrasting, you know, results that we uh, that that we see in which uh, Prabowo turns out to uh, take many of the districts in in Sumatra. So I think that's uh, quite interesting uh, to see this. Uh, to see these findings, slide sebelumnya, lagi, yes, no, this one. Now, if you look at to the number of uh, fourth comparisons between regions, so total number of districts in every pulau in Indonesia, I count that. So, one interesting finding is that to see, despite uh, Prabowo wins more districts in 2019, but he ended up having less votes on average, actually, compared to uh, 2014. So winning more regions for him doesn't mean that he gained more votes. Because if you remember in 2014, <coughs> Prabowo uh, lost to Jokowi with uh, five to six percent of margin in 2014. But in 2019, according to uh, CSIS quick count, he lost to 11.2% uh, to Pak Jokowi. So it could be because the total votes that Pak Jokowi win in Central and East Java can compensate you know, his loss in many other districts uh, in, uh, in Pulau Sumatra. And also if you look at the 2014 uh, results, <coughs> Jokowi won in all regions in Indonesia, so in Java, Sumatra, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, to Bali, and lain-lain means NTT, Maluku, and Maluku Utara. He won in those uh, areas, but in 2019, he lost to Prabowo in uh, Sumatra, obviously, and then he also uh, lost uh, slightly in, uh, in Pulau Sulawesi. So looking at to these results and also to next map, to this map, sometimes I wonder what do we exactly mean by saying that, okay, we are having uh, polarization uh, these days in Indonesia, but I remember Edward Aspinall uh, just wrote a piece in the, in the New Mandala that uh, uh, challenged actually the common notions of these polarizations by saying that what's actually happening in Indonesia right now is what you already mentioned at the beginning, Mas Phillips, that is the return of ideological competitions that already there in Indonesia in 1950s, right? Because at the time, you know, you have Mashumi, uh, the uh, dominant party in Pulau Sumatra, and then you have NU, and then some other uh, Islamic uh, political parties in uh, West, uh, sorry, in, in, in Java Island. And then that kind of uh, differences between the two regions uh, he said it uh, remained true for uh, Indonesian uh, politics uh, given the results of the presidential elections of 2019. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Okta. <coughs> um, the, that uh, complements the, 
the qualitative uh, accounts of the uh, state and politics in Indonesia. Uh, Ibu <coughs> Perludem, Titi Anggraini, the 10 minutes is yours. Yeah, thank you Uda Philips. Actually, uh, I'm from Sumatra like Uda Philips, so we share the same feelings, yeah Uda. Um, <coughs> Uh, thank you CSS and Amine Fulbright and Yusindo for inviting, inviting me. I'm Titi Anggraini from Perludem, a local NGO based in Jakarta, Association for Election and Democracy. Um, I will talk uh, especially from the election context, from the legal framework. I won't touch uh, the issue of uh, identity politics from the political perspective like Pak Munjid, Mbak Nafa and Mas Nuri. Well, um, firstly, um, <clears throat> I would like to start by saying that uh, in the midst of a very tight competition and also a very difficult technical complexity challenge, the 2019 election runs peacefully and is full of voter enthusiasm. Even in my polling station, uh, I arrived at 7.30 and got the apa, um, uh, Antrian tickets and I already <coughs> uh, got the numbers of 43. It's never happened in my polling station before. The voter turned out always below 60%. But in last election, the voter turned out in my polling uh, station uh, more than 80%, 83%. For the first time in uh, apa, uh, election history in my uh, complex. Gitu. So uh, <laughs> I think we have to um, uh, appreciate uh, what we achieve on the voting day uh, in uh, April 17. <clears throat> okay, um, the 2019 election, uh, we are the third largest democracy in the world after India and the United States. But from the uh, elections, the voting day, uh, we are the biggest one day election in the world. We run uh, the biggest one-day election in the world with five ballot uh, papers and more than 190 million voters. Uh, we also the most uh, we also run the most complex election in the world. We don't have to be proud of this, but it's not easy to run the most complex election in the world peacefully. Um, we are also the largest democratic Muslim country in the world. And talking about 2019 election as the background uh, for the legal framework, we use law number seven year 2017 uh, that regulates all the provision on the contestation, how we uh, manage the election stages and so on and so on. As you, uh, for your information, this law, law number seven 2017, enacted by president, signed by President Jokowi, only one day before we officially started the election stages. So President Jokowi signed the law April, uh, sorry, August 16, one day before the Independence Day, uh, 2017, and KPU officially announced the, uh, uh, the, the election sta uh, stages to start the election stages for 2019 election uh, on uh, August 17. So can you imagine that our election organizer, organizers must run the most complex election with a very, what is it, tight time to prepare all the things. Um, 2019 election is the most phenomenal, historical, and experimental election for us in Indonesia. This is the most competitive and complex election. Why? Uh, conducted simultaneously, same day, same time, same polling station. We have more than 813,000 polling stations <coughs> all across Indonesia. Five ballot papers, except in Jakarta, only five ballots, with open list system for DPR and DPRD. So in last election, we have almost 8,000 uh, DPR candidates and almost eight, uh, 300,000 um, legislative candidates for DPR and DPRD. It's not a small election. And also it's a competitive election because for the first time uh, we increased the parliamentary threshold uh, rate from 3.5 percent to 4 percent uh, parliamentary threshold. So based on the survey or the quick count, uh, uh, conducted by uh, Uda Phillips and the gang, uh, only s uh, nine political parties uh, can get seats in the parliament. 
And also, um, it's competitive because um, we have 16 political parties plus four local political parties in Aceh. Can you imagine that we have four percent of parliamentary thresholds, and the same time, at the same time, the, the number of political parties increase from 12 political parties in 2014 election into 16 political national political parties in 2019. They must uh, gain seats in parliament with high numbers of parliamentary threshold, but more competitors uh, from the uh, election contestant. And also, why one of the factors why we have polarization? Well, Pak Munjit, I think uh, beside the the, uh, the factors and the reasons uh, uh, already mentioned by Pak Munjit and Nuri and Pak Nafa, but I think the polarization also conducted unnaturally because the polarization also forced by the election system by implementing the presidential threshold, uh, presidential nomination threshold. In our election law, it's, it's stipulated that uh, if political party or coalition of political party wants to nominate a uh, candidate, uh, presidential candidate, they must have 20% of seats and 25% or 25% or of valid votes that resulted from the last election. It, 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 it is the only uh, provision in the world like this. By having the presidential threshold, it's like a political party may, uh, must have a kawin paksa, forced to being married, yeah? It's not natural. The coalition uh, apa, uh, formed by the political party is not a, a natural coalition. So that's why from 2014 and 2019, we have the same uh, presidential candidates. Dia lagi, dia lagi. We have more than 250 million population. We have 16 political parties. We have more than 190 million voters, but only dia lagi, dia, dia lagi candidates. And well, um, um, it is not easy to build a presidential nomination coalition that uh, that that um, what um, with a different ideology of political parties. So, um, in my opinion, why we have a polarization like now, uh, one of the factor is because the uh, legislator legislator forced to implement the presidential threshold uh, provision in uh, our presidential nominations, and also um, limited and lack of information access to the legislative candidates make religion become one of the consideration for voters to cast their votes. Um, not on, um, but uh, unfortunately, because they have um, limited access on the legislative election candidates, they uh, receive um, information from um, what is it, uh, their uh, close uh, person or uh, their family members that force them to make uh, to cast their vote based on the religion aspect. And uh, unfortunately, the the religion politicization of religion also combined with the hoax and disinformation. For instance, uh, you heard that in um, Karawang that there's a hoax uh, 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 disseminated by a uh, 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 young lady that if Jokowi win, so the, uh, Jokowi will legalize LGBT. So um, um, I think um, the, the um, the competitive election and limited and lack of information, uh, lack of information access access to the um, legislative election, also one of the factor why uh, we have a politicization of religion that also combined with disinformation and uh, misinformation. Um, I think um, for the next, what we should do, we must uh, comprehensively evaluate our election law and then revoke the presidential threshold. And I went to the uh, Constitutional Court two times to revoke the provision on uh, presidential threshold. I gained success, AKA successfully rejected by Constitutional Court uh, twice. But I won't stop. Um, I think we have to continue the elect, uh, election uh, electoral reform in Indonesia by having more, uh, what is it, uh, flexible, uh, provision on the presidential nomination. So Indonesian people can have more options, more choices on the presidential candidates, not like now, dia lagi, dia lagi. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Titi. <coughs> now, because we started late, <coughs> so I think we have uh, until uh, 3.15, so it's going to be like 15 minutes uh, behind the schedule. Uh, it's been interesting to listen to all the speakers, but uh, I think the, the ideas are not conclusive. Uh, even I, I've seen some differences. Uh, for example, Pak uh, Munjit and Pak Ron kind of saying that there is some sort of a division or divided after the election, but uh, uh, Okta said that it's actually not as bad as we thought. Uh, he's using his own measure, that is the density of mosque, which is, I think, a very interesting measure that uh, I think we can explore more after this. Uh, and secondly, uh, to Ibu Nafa, maybe, uh, she is saying that the, 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 the agenda of the Islamists is now is more subtle, it's more, uh, no longer a violent, um, using violent means to achieve the goals and so on. So in a way, they are becoming moderate in their efforts. Different They're different from, the, <laughs> different from ISIS. Uh, so in a way, it's kind of a, they're adopting new strategies and so on, which is more difficult to tackle, I think, because uh, that's more subtle and more, more cultural and so on. Now, <clears throat> with that in mind, I'd like to open the, the floor for a few questions. Uh, for the first round, I'd like to invite two or three. Uh, the one in the big uh, in the in the front, uh, the other at the back, the the very back, uh, and then another one, uh, bapak with the checkered shirt, baju kotak kotak abu abu. Uh, we can uh, open the uh, next round later on. Please be brief so you can give other uh, participants to uh, ask questions as well. Yes, Mark, please, please be brief. Uh, thank you. It's a very uh, important and meaningful, uh, good information that you shared all. But I, I would like to uh, first touch on uh, Ms. Nava, who gave us the, the, the very good uh, point about what is the next agenda of Islamic. I, I believe the Islamic is not one single uh, vote or one single identity, I believe that. And even uh, to, about this event, this, this topic, politics and religion, is, it's not something new actually. I think even from Rome Paul Republic, religion and politics has been mingled with each other. So what happened today is nothing new. What is new, as uh, put by uh, Mr. Norai, is the, the more effective use of mosque as a campaign as a campaign field rather than the rally. You know, I think this is something that I learned from this year election, that more mosques has been used for political purpose rather than as a place for worship. What I know now today, more uh, Ustad that against the presidents or against Jokowi is more popular, more ex as accepted acceptable by the most Muslim. I think this is something new that I need to, you further to elaborate. Whether it is true that the, the majority of mosques now being used as a political uh, uh, campaign venue rather than a worship place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one, the one at the very back. Yes. With the hat, with the glasses. Please uh, introduce yourself as okay. well. Thank you for the time. My name is Ivan. Uh, I just want to share my opinions because uh, the title is Politics and Religion in Indonesia. There are many kinds of politics and there are many religions in Indonesia. And all I hear is in here is all about Islam. What about other religion? The first and the second is, is Pancasila is not religious enough? Are people of Indonesia not well educated or not educated well? And I think it's kind of some agenda with uh, the Fida et Impera. It's fighting each other. That Indonesia will chaos and easy to take over. What about that? That's another, another opinion of me. But uh, there are some of hoax, hoax news, hoax contribution in, the, in this election about 
many many hoaks is sharing by many people what about that okay thank you thank you last one thank you very much for the opportunity um i would like to ask mr uh, doctor that um that your presentation uh, revealed that 97 percent of minority in Indonesia, minority religious minority in Indonesia fought for President Jokowi. Is this about, is it have a kind of factor like Islamophobia, as we say that Mr. Nur is uh, uh, finding about the geographically in East and Central Java, Jokowi have uh, decisively win the election, which is we know that do, those two uh, provincial uh, is a, a moderate Islam, uh, rise, uh, uh, moderate, moderate uh, Islam stronghold, which is they are uh, truly against the kind of like narration like that Teka and said that we will, uh, we will, if, if Prabowo won that, uh, if, if Prabowo win that, we will go to like in Syria, something like that, Islamophobia like that. Is, is, is it, is it uh, have an influence with the, the 97% of minority religious and uh, the win of Jokowi in East and Central Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think uh, we have one question to Okta <coughs> about your measure and the uh, mass density and whether or not mass actually has been used, uh, you know, in the in the campaign. And then the, we have question to Pa Munjit, the last one, <coughs> and uh, to Ibu Nafa as well. But in general, there are questions. Last one being, uh, is Pancasila enough for us, you know, to deal with? Uh, all these uh, questions about religion and the states. Uh, Okta, please start. Please also be brief. Yes, uh, thank you for the questions. So whether or not MOS is being used for the campaign. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, in my presentations, uh, if he says that MOS uh, or many MOS are being used for the campaign, then I said at the beginning that the, the vote you know, with districts with higher most density should have gone to Prabowo instead of Jokowi. But the results showed the opposite, right? Districts or Kabupaten Kota with higher most density tend to vote for Jokowi more than Prabowo. The question is why? I just may, I can speculate on that maybe as uh, to the extent that MOS uh, is being used, I think it's uh, very uh, confined to some uh, provinces uh, in Indonesia. Maybe in Jakarta or in West Java, the two provinces that became stronghold for Jokowi, many MOS will become politicized, right? But when you go to other areas, other provinces in Indonesia, that's really, I think, not the case. Because uh, you see the result, right? Uh, Jokowi wins. Uh, in the districts with higher most density, and he also wins in a district with lower or less most density. So it means that the politicizations of uh, agama, the masjid, it's actually on average not really effective to sway voters for Prabowo. That's the way I see my 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 results. Thank you. Um, um, okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to respond to Masnuri. Uh, how, how did you come to that conclusion? Actually, we, we, we are curious. Because uh, Central Java and East Java, uh, you know, uh, voted for Jokowi. And of course, there are many mosques there. And because the, the population is very, very dense, uh, if you make average, and, and as, as you know, that Japanese population is 40% of the total population. Um, so if you make average based on you know, the total number of all the mosques divided into you know, uh, the, the population, then probably uh, it works because it works uh, because Jokowi won in Central Java and East Java. Uh, but that's just... Uh, you know, brief response to you. Uh, I don't know how did you come to the conclusion. Okay, for the question for me, the number that I use is not mine. Ninety-seven percent non-Muslim footed for uh, Jokowi uh, is provided by many institutions, indicator politics and others. 
So it is up to us on how to interpret what the number means. And I didn't say that it means Islamophobia. It means for me that non-Muslim uh, saw more hope in Jokowi in relation to the policies and others probably. And exactly because many of the hardliners flock around Prabowo. Clearly, Prabowo is not an ideal figure for Muslim footers uh, in, in many sense. However, because of uh, his move, I don't want to say his policy, his move, you know, uh, he can be at least temporary alliance for this Islamist. You know, uh, I don't even, you know, I, I can't imagine if Prabowo really won, what's going to happen to the Islamists. Because, you know, uh, there's so many, you know, factions uh, within that circle. So probably the situation can be worse than if they lost. Uh, thank God they lost. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but again, the number is not mine, and I think there are many interpretations that we can make why 97% of the footers voted for Jokowi, without necessarily understood as Islamophobia. Uh, I would say that uh, the hope for maintaining Indonesia as imagined by most of the people uh, is more reasonable under uh, Jokowi. Of course, we have so many problems with Jokowi, but, uh, but in that case, I think it makes some sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll just address the question of uh, where are the other religions. So um, I think once one group asks for some kind of majoritarianism, that it's, it's going to be like an epidemic, you know. Uh, here you have Perda Syariah, in Manokwari you have Perda Injil, and, and then a group of government officials from Manokwari did a comparative study in Aceh about the implementation of Perda Syariah, so they can do the same in Manokwari except it's the opposite. So um, it's, 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 not, it's not a good trend at all, uh, whether it's done by the, East, the Muslim groups, the Christian groups, the Hindu groups in Bali. Now, if everyone turns to be like FPE, then you know, we're in big trouble. Uh, so what's, but on the one hand, uh, we, we have to, uh, what we want is the equality, you know, a constitutional guarantee of equality uh, of all citizens, regardless of their ethnicity and religion. But on the other hand, we also have to acknowledge the underlying factors behind why, why is this, you know, the minority mentality of the majority population? is strong, they said minority is not in terms of numbers or quantity, but uh, the you know, control over economy, for example. So it's based on legitimate grievances. And if, if there is you know, one positive impact of the Tuantu movement is that, is that it forced Jokowi to focus more on uh, equality, uh, socioeconomic uh, inequality. Um, now the next one is, is Panchasila enough? Uh, well, obviously it's not. Now everyone can say, you know, I'm Pancasila, I'm Pancasila, I'm nationalist, but what does that mean? How do you operationalize Pancasila? As Pak Natsir said, Pancasila is like an empty room, you know, you can fill it with whatever you want. So um, that's uh, how to operationalize Pancasila, for example. If some religious groups, they have indoctrination program from, you know, kindergarten level up to, um, you know, the adult, the grown-up level, so what, you know, what is, what is, how do you operationalize Pancasila in that matter? And, you know, is one's interpretation of Pancasila is better than the others on, on what basis? So I think this is, you know, this is a long-term problem, socioeconomic inequality, your interpretation of Pancasila. Um, it, it's not something that we can solve in the short term, but I, I'm, I'm still optimistic. Thank you. Ron, you would like to respond to any question? All right, thank you. So um, it's interesting that it was taken my comments were saying 
there is polarization. What I was saying, I don't think there is, and I agree with your assessment that what appeared to be polarization uh, was disunified groups allying behind two candidates because there were only two candidates. If there were three candidates or four candidates, then we wouldn't have seen what looked like polarization wouldn't have taken place. As to far as, is Panchasila enough? Reciting Panchasila is not enough. Living Panchasila would be enough. Uh, how do you operationalize it? Well, okay, I'm doing research on Gepe uh, Bansler. Being willing to give up your life for someone of another faith is living Panchasila. That would be enough. Uh, my other question when you think about it, uh, and I do, I do this at many meetings, who in the room has had lunch this last week, seven days, with somebody of another religion? Okay, this is an unusual room, but it looks like we only hit about 30%. Go to many places, go to Muhammadiyah campuses, go to two people, you know, two out of a, a, a people out of a room this size. But again, we still had about 60% no. I mean, you can only hate somebody of another, hate people of another religion if you know no one of that other religion. If you regularly gather, break bread with people of another ethnic group, another religion, another whatever, you're not going to fall into the uh, rhetoric of, oh, they're evil. Because you're like, well, maybe as a whole, but not, you know, so you're like, well, Joe isn't evil, you know, Ahmed isn't evil, you know, so, you know, I, I don't think so. So, thank you. Thank you. Didi, you would like to respond to any? No? Right. Uh, we have, no, you have given one chance. I'll give to another, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, after the, this round, okay? So I give the opportunity to others. Uh, Ibu, Didi, and Bapa. And then the, the person in the in the front, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the panelists. Many of them are actually my friends. Uh, I just want to raise uh, something that missing from this discussion is actually about the experience of women, the gender issues that. Uh, unfortunately, no one in the panel is actually talking about how gender plays between uh, politics and also religion. And uh, I believe that uh, because like women are 50% of the votes, yeah, so I think there are some kind of difference uh, about how religious narrative is actually have been built to attract uh, men foods and also uh, women foods. So for example, because I'm working in the Human Rights Commission, that we see that actually uh, the bill of uh, anti-sexual violence have been used by certain political parties to attack uh, certain uh, pol political parties as well. So for example, that these anti-sexual bills uh, that endorsed by the government is actually want to legalize uh, LGBT and also pro-adultery, something like that. And they put a finger on certain uh, political parties that they say that this, those parties is actually uh, agree uh, for the uh, sexual anti-sexual bills so I was just curious about that yeah so from from your observation how actually uh, the narrative uh, gender narrative that actually also play a lot to attract uh, like uh, women foods that's number one and the second is is uh, I was I would like to push uh, the discussion beyond the election, especially about Nafa say about the Islamization of public life and also the religion. Uh, for, for me personally, I really concerned about uh, this issue because now all the, those, uh, let's, uh, let's say, conservative groups, is actually they also use the legal ways, the democratic ways to instill their political agenda. So for example, through 
KUHP uh, through uh, many uh, revision of the legislation that actually now are discussing in the parliament and also in the local level that of course the now they don't use perda sharia they use more on the like public order regulation but inside those local regulation is actually uh, imposing certain uh, standard of morality and, and also certain standard of uh, religious value. Thank you. Thank you. Silakan, Pak. <clears throat> thank you. My name is Bambang Sudewo. First, I'd like to thank you all the presenters for uh, very informative presentations. My first question is for Mbak Nafa. I would like to know more about this, what you call Islamist majoritarianism. What will they treat, how they will treat this, uh, those who have the status as guests in this uh, majoritarianism, uh, especially their rights in practicing their religion or their, their social uh, civil rights, and how they will treat uh, the Muslim, but not as peers as uh, HTI, for example, uh, the, the so-called Muslim Abangan, or now they call POSMO Muslim. My second question is for Pak Munjit. How, uh, how do you connect this indigenous or indigenized Muslim with NU? Because lately, or especially recently, NU is, I was confused when Pak Agil Sirat says that Pak Mahmud uh, MD is not NU Kader. So how, how do you relate uh, indigenized Muslim with NU now? Are they the same or they differ? How they differ? Thank you. Thank you. Last one, please. No. Thank you. Uh, a quick one from me. I'm Wahyudi from the Straits Times. Uh, I would like to get uh, some views from the experts here. Uh, uh, whether uh, we are seeing a rise of Islamism now how bad is it? Uh, and come election 2024, 2024 uh, would we have higher chance of uh, seeing a leader from the conservative group, from the Salafi, uh, win the election next time round? And would also like to get your views on how the government uh, can do uh, to effectively curb the rise of Islamism that they haven't done or that they are doing uh, which you think uh, are not enough. Thank you. Thank you. So first one is an open question to all about the, the, the gender issues in the election. Who wants to tackle that? Titi? All right. Um, thank you, Mbak Riri, for uh, remind us to talk about a very important topics yeah, about <laughs> women, <coughs> uh, religion, and politics. Well, actually, uh, Bariri, based on my observation, uh, women issues still an uh, uh, artificial issue for both for the candidates. Uh, women more fanatic and more uh, militant for 2019 election as voters and as campaigner. But if we um, read the um, uh, vision and mission of the candidates, they don't talk much about what uh, their agenda for a uh, woman. Um, they re uh, created uh, politic magma and then uh, uh, woman wings uh, within uh, the two team, but they don't talk much woman as an actor, as, the, and, uh, as a subject, but more than as an object. And I agree with you that uh, uh, issues on uh, undang-undang penghapusan kekerasan seksual uh, used by some of the politicians, even in our DAPIL, because we are from the same electorates, Tangerang Selatan, uh, to attack other political parties. That uh, the political party uh, try to promote, to legalize the LGBT, and so on and so on. But I think we have to... Uh, uh, taking it to account and uh, take it seriously yeah, for our uh, apa, uh, advocacy agenda after um, uh, uh, we know the, the names of the elected MPs. Because I think there's no new uh, names, uh, mostly the incumbent re-elected. It means we will uh, fight with the same uh, groups in parliament. 
So I agree with you, uh, it's like an alarm for us. Women become important as an object, but not as a subject. Uh, the agenda more to gain their votes, but not to make them as an political actors or political subject in our uh, election arena. Yeah. Thank you, Bunafa. There, there are questions directing, directed to you. Uh, what's this majoritarianism going to look like? Look no further to Yudoyono's era. I mean, all this, the, you know, the SKB of Antempat Ibadah, all the rules that how SBY accommodated the conservative um, within government institutions, uh, not just MUI. So um, that's, that's a taste of, you know, what they want. But um, on the other hand, uh, I, would, I would just point you to this, uh, the, the article written by uh, Marcus Mitzner, Mas Burhan, and Bariska on the... Uh, you know, it's based on a, uh, a survey of intolerance in the past uh, 10 years, and it, it, it shows that uh, first the level of intolerance has an increase. It's just the, the, the demography change. It's now the more uh, the better educated and the more well-off people are likely to be conservative or intolerant. But on the other hand, there's a rise of political intolerance rather than cultural intolerance. So cul cultural intolerance is like you know building churches in the neighborhood, something like that. Um, and, and we know that the two and two leaders pay lip service to tolerance. They said, no, we don't have problem with minority. We protect their rights, but we don't want them to, uh, but they also have to tau diri, tau tempatnya. You know, the, uh, that's, it, it's, it's, it's their kind of uh, party line on the issue of, of tolerance. So. Um, it's okay, but don't go beyond your private space. So in public life, uh, uh, the privilege would be for whatever the majority is. If in Java it's the Muslims, in Papua it's the you know the, the Christians, and that's that's what I'm that's why I'm I'm really worried about. And um, so it's what we're, what we're likely to see, uh, as Pat Phillips said, maybe these Islamist groups have moderated, uh, or is it that the definition of moderation have shifted has shifted to the right? Thank you. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, is indigenous Islam uh, the same or different with NU? Okay. Uh, I would not say the same because if I said the same, then only NU is the version of indigenous uh, religion. Uh, indigenous Islam, uh, sorry. Because we see in, uh, you know, in South uh, Sulawesi, in Central Sulawesi, uh, the kind of Islam that is practiced by the Muslim there is also indigenous Islam. Uh, in, in West Sumatra, uh, we have uh, kaum muda and kaum tua, uh, and kaum tua is a form of indigenous Islam. So it's not the same with NU. However, I, I would say yes, NU is a form of indigenous uh, Islam, um, which is therefore different from uh, Puritan Islam, in the sense that Islam is, should should be purified from anything that considered as non-Islamic aspect, including local culture, uh, because indigenous Islam uh, see local culture as a dialogue partner. And therefore, uh, being Japanese, being Minang, being uh, Bugis and others, is not antithetical to being Muslim and also being Indonesian at the same time. Uh, well, the question about why Pak Mahfud was considered not necessarily as and you is more of, of political, you know, uh, situation. Uh, so of course. Uh, his Maduris, and people say that 99% of Maduris are NU. The rest are probably Muhammadiyah, and uh, it's, it's a joke. Uh, but uh, yes, Professor Mahmoud uh, was NU uh, by birth, by blood, and uh, some other become NU by research, like uh, Pak Ronald. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, the, the second question, uh, uh, are we witnessing the rise of uh, Islamic uh, conservatism? 
I would say we are witnessing the rise of Islamic formalism. And they are different. You know, uh, uh, why? Uh, the, 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 the more interesting question for me is why? If that is the case, why? I would say we are uh, experiencing the changing of landscape of Muslim since 1990s. You know, among the others, because of the new order uh, project of modernization, uh, public school, public health, and others, then because Muslim are the majority, they enjoy it, uh, benefit the project of modernization. More Muslim, eventually in 1990s, enter public universities. However, most of these Muslim are not necessarily people coming from very well-trained, uh, you know, uh, Islam. And, and many of them only got Islamic education at public school, which is very, very superficial. However, because of the uh, new order politicization of religion, including Islam, then their religion become very political. Remember that in 1965, everybody should be associated with one particular religion. If not, they can be accused of being communist, and that's very serious. And therefore, being religious means to demonstrate their religious identity. I am part of this group, I am part of that group, and that is very political. Um, and, 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 and therefore, formalism became very important. In the past, pious religious people tend not to demonstrate their, their piety. But today, even if you're not pious, you're supposed to demonstrate your piety. That is very political. And therefore, that's very formalistic. And therefore, it's very good for political commodity. It's very good for economic commodity. And the business person enjoy that. So I think uh, uh, we are witnessing the rise of Islamic formalism that can be easily twisted for economic purpose and for political uh, purpose. How the government should take care of that? Uh, I have no idea. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Munjit. Pak Ron, please. And Ubay Research. Yeah. So. <laughs> and carry harga mati. Um, so, um, whether, I don't know if in 2024 a, a Salafi president is possible, although as I mentioned to you uh, at lunch, um, it, if that candidate seems strong, I don't pray, but I think I'll start praying for it not to happen. Um, you know, oftentimes we do talk about tolerance. Tolerance is not enough. I mean, so your child brings a boyfriend or a girlfriend home. Mom, Dad, we want to get married. I tolerate him so much. <laughs> no. You want love, cherish, listen to, value, protect. That can be done between communities in Indonesia. And you, you know, what can the government do? Well, and maybe Jakarta is, I don't know if this room is different or Jakarta is different and for so many people to have had lunch in the last week with someone of not of their religion um, out in, out in Kampung, Desa Desa, never, no. And, you know, there's a, I forget the name of it, there's a Pizantran in um, uh, out by Bora Bador that um, regularly participates in soccer tournaments with the Christian schools so that the kids can interact. Now, they interact as opponents on the field, uh, but, you know, we used to think that you know, the um, Ministry of Youth and Sports was a throwaway ministry. SBA gave it to PKS on a regular basis. Um, we could rethink about it as the most important ministry. If they set up opportunities for kids not only to play against, but to play sports with people of other ethnic groups, other religious groups on the same team, 
Um, that is how I would want, I think is the, would be the best way to face off Islamism, or uh, is not straight on, because that's not gonna work. Because that's, what that's gonna do is people who aren't Islamists are gonna then support the Islamists. You know? Um, ban Hata'i and other Muslims who aren't Hata'i say, mm, maybe you shouldn't have banned them. Um, again, a lived Panchasila, people regularly interacting with people of a different faith. And yeah, I think, I think the sports ministry is the ministry that can make that happen. Thank you. Okta? Yeah, with regard to whether or not uh, we are seeing the rise of uh, Islamization in the future, there was a, a survey conducted by LSE uh, last year that asked people about uh, who's the most popular uh, ulama or Islamic preachers in Indonesia. And then if you look at the result, number one was Abdul Somad. And then Mama Dede came second. And then Arifin Ilham uh, third, Aa Gim, and then uh, Yusuf Mansur. So these five uh, Islamic preachers, these are all individuals uh, who are not necessarily affiliated themselves with two largest Islamic organizations in Indonesia, Nahdlatul Ulama and then Muhammadiyah. These five people, they are most listened by people. So despite the two organizations, they claim that they have millions, millions of supporters, but it turns out that millions of Indonesians are listening more to these individual preachers who don't have you know, organizations. So I could say that in the future, in the future, maybe what we're going to see is more and more independent Muslims who are loosely you know, coordinated. They are not affi necessarily affiliated themselves with the uh, established uh, organizations in Indonesia. And then that could lead to uh, many, I think, implications for Indonesian uh, politics in the future. And then the last thing, <coughs> whether or not we're going to see uh, the rise of Islamism in the future, the way I see it is that in the next five years, we're going to see the same uh, politics what PDIP did uh, during uh, SBY era. So PDIP uh, being a consistent opposition for two terms of President SBY, 2004 up to 2014, keep you know, criticizing what uh, SBY did and one, one, you know, uh, giving people uh, some alternatives. And then they managed to uh, gain, you know, to perform uh, admirably in some local elections in Indonesia at the time in West Java. If you recall, uh, Tetan Masluki, and then uh, he came second at the time. And then Jokowi won Jakarta, and then also in North Sumatra, and then in Central Java. They won, you know, this uh, pro uh, gubernatorial elections, and that led to President Jokowi, uh, with Jokowi's winning in 2014, right? Criticizing the government. What does it mean for Green and Pekas? If they believe that what they did so far, playing the religious card, is quite effective for them in swaying, you know, people's uh, vote for them, I think they're going to use the same strategy for the next five years, and that could make our politics uh, becomes uh, even worse. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now, our time is up. Uh, I don't know how to summarize. Uh, I'm tasked to summarize, actually, but I don't know how, Pak Alan, because of the richness of the discussion. But at least I think I can sense that uh, we do have some sort of deadly combination right now. Our institutional setup is not favorable for encouraging uh, less division, as Ibu Titi uh, mentioned, that the threshold, the presidential, <clears throat> to nominate the presidential candidate uh, kind of producing the, the division that we have. Uh, maybe that's a uh, homework for all of us, uh, NGOs, academics, to think about. Maybe our institutional setup contributes to the rise of this division within our society, and that will require a lot of thinking. Uh, 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 from us. And uh, on, on the other hand, our socio sociological context is, is now rather difficult. Uh, we may see the rise of uh, 
Islamic formalization or whatever you call it. But uh, now, and uh, something that is intriguing uh, that Ibn Nafa said is that maybe the Islam is, the, the term moderate now becomes uh, kind of a adopting conservative sense. And that's something I think uh, uh, very new because we used to think that Indonesia is a moderate Muslim country and so on, but now it is defined by the conservative. And this is, I think, also another homework for us. Uh, we, we do need to study this. What do we mean by moderates in Indonesia and how do we tackle through policies and through uh, <clears throat> you know, activities at the national level uh, and on local levels. And lastly, uh, I think the suggestion from Professor Ron, uh, I think is, is very useful that we need to have a living Pancasila. It's not something that we, we just cite or we just say, but something really living. It's like living constitution and now we have to have living Pancasila. And maybe we don't see that much in, the, in, in, in Jakarta, but I believe in, in the regions we could still see this living Pancasila thing that we need to focus more on, uh, you know, in, in this in, in discussion. And lastly, I think my first, my initial question to this panel was that, is all, all, are all this temporary? And uh, I got a sense that it is temporary, uh, you know, because of the election. And then that because maybe we just need to adjust our expectation about you know, a moderation or moderate or, or, or the Islamic uh, context in Indonesia. But once I think we can change all the three uh, aspects that I mentioned earlier, maybe then it becomes temporary. So it depends on us, you know, whether or not we are going to have this as a temporary phenomenon or is it continue. But if we keep silent, maybe then it becomes permanent. But I believe as Baron already says, this is a room that is rather different. This is outliers in the group. <laughs> you know, in the room is outlier from the Indonesian context. Uh, for your information, I think CSIS has the most, uh, the highest density of Minang researcher. <laughs> right? So I think we are in the 14, not the 86% of Minang. <laughs> so I think it's, it's really upon us. Uh, here, I believe, with your organization, uh, there was people from Komnas, Iburiri, and so on. Uh, it is in our hands of how we are going to do about this. And uh, I believe uh, CSIS is committed to, to do this, to, to keep our constitution, and to have our living Pancasila. Now, please join me in thanking the fabulous speakers that we have. And of course, thanking all of us for your contribution and your thought. I'll see you, hopefully we can see you in the next event at CSIS. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for the speakers and moderator. Uh, next, I would like to invite our moderator and speaker.